Buenos días. Bienvenidos. I am Alfredo Celedón Luján, and I'm humbled to say that I am currently the first Latinx Chicano president of the National Council of Teachers of English and a proud member of the Latinx caucus. I am therefore honored to introduce Elizabeth Acevedo, winner of more literary awards than I can count in my two hands and two feet. In introducing her, I want to mention that though many of her readers are from the East Coast, her books have stretched across the country as far west as San Antonio, where librarians Patricia Rogers of Riddler Middle School and Zinia Bayardo of Stevens High School ordered Acevedo's books because of their young woman protagonists who are both brave and vulnerable. And they want to know, when are you coming to Texas? And the books have also reached the classroom of Anjali Nermulin in Monterey, Mexico. I am lucky, as other bilingual readers of Elizabeth's musical language, though I am Northern New Mexican, and she and her characters, most of her characters are Dominican, I am able to follow the code switches and cultural nuances of Elizabeth, Ziomara, Imani, Camino, and Yaida. Chamaquita, curandera, viejitos, barrio, chancletas resonate in my experience, mm -hmm. and so does hair and rollers. This is to say that her writing appeals to both the bilingual and the monolingual reader. I don't know if you'll have time in this conversation, Elizabeth, but as a reader and teacher of writing, I'd like to know if there's a secret to helping students flesh out a sentence like, I hate or love mud, to mud that suctions and slurps and is tracked into the house, how it dries and clings stubbornly um, uh, and, uh, and is tracked into the house and, sting, and clings stubbornly to a shoe. This attention to detail draws the reader in, though what we, through what we teachers call concrete detail. I have to say though, that of all the vivid images I've read in your work, the passage that sticks to my mind for its image through gesture comes uh, in with the fire on high. Buela folds a dish towel and places it on the counter. This touched me because I witnessed my own grandmother's abuelitas do the very same thing in Northern New Mexico and in California. And that's my point. For generations, Spanish bilingual student readers have longed for finding ourselves in a book through the home language and authenticity of her narrators and speakers, Elizabeth invites us in. I want to help young readers create imagery through gesture as well. So there's the X. What about the X? In Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mango Street, we have ZZ the X, and then we have Latin X, more recently Chican X, and now the Poet X. Please welcome Elizabeth Acevedo, who will begin by sharing a poem with us, and then she will answer brilliant questions from brilliant students. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo, for that beautiful introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And um, this is for us. This is for us writers, us readers, us girls who never saw ourselves on bookshelves, but were still writing poems when we talked. And we've been called teeth sucking of snapping eyes, born bitter, brittle, of tangled tongues, sandpaper that's been origamied into girl, not worthy of being the hero, they said, nor the author, they said, 
but we were always Medusa's favorite daughters of serpent curls, of hard eyed looks, dreaming in the foreshadow we composed ourselves since childhood, taking pens to our palms as if we could rewrite the stanzas of lifelines that try to tell us we would never amount to much. And when we were relegated to the margins, we still dance bachata in the footnotes. We still clawed our way onto the cover, brought our full selves to the page, our every color palette and bouquet of pansies, of big gold hoops, of these here hips and smart ass quips and popping bubble gum kisses. Us girls who never saw ourselves on bookshelves, but we're still writing tales in the dark. Us black and brown girls, brick built, masters of every metaphor and every metamorphosis, not just with fresh manicures, nail filing down obsidian stone and painstakingly crafting our own mirrors and stories into existence. Thank you. I'm so delighted to answer some questions. Great. Well, we have questions from students now. Hi, my name is Kimberly German, and my first question is, what motivated you to become an author? What inspired you? And were there any challenges that prevented you from reaching your goals, if any? I, um, I became a writer because of what I observed in my community. Um, I grew up in Manhattan, in New York City, in a neighborhood that has had many different names and is currently called Morningside Heights. It's about five blocks from the line where Harlem begins, which is um, a neighborhood that uh, a lot of folks recognize as a you know historically black neighborhood in New York that um, was the Mecca, right, of arts. And it was fascinating for me to grow up in the crux of Columbia University and Harlem and all of the intersections of affluence that came on one side and um, the ways in which, you know, the other side was almost forgotten. And my writing, I think, was reflecting early on, even at the age of 10 or 11 at like disparity. And I didn't know that word then. But this idea of, you know, those kids on Broadway, <laughs> they move a little different. They got a little bit more than we do. And so my writing was was just trying to understand. I think writing is thinking. Writing is processing. Writing is an attempt to arrive. And um for a kid who didn't always feel like I had an outlet or like the questions I had had clear answers or like I knew who to ask, um, I turned to writing as a way to, to try to find those answers. And, you know, there's always been naysayers. I, I write in a really particular way. I am unapologetic about the Spanish and the Spanish not being italicized, about slang, about wanting to celebrate blackness and Latinidad and the messiness of what we are, right? That, um, my characters are not perfect, even as I write them tenderly. And I've, I've had a lot of folks, you know, well, if you tried this, or what if you had another white character? You, you may not see a lot of those in my books, right? <laughs> because I'm particular about who who and what I'm trying to show and who I want to center. And, and the stories are so specific. And so I've had to learn how to kind of just, you know, ignore the folks who don't see my vision. And that goes from undergrad to grad school, to different writing programs, to so folks who have a project they think I should be doing versus the the work I know is is the calling. And so, yeah, there's always haters. <laughs> and I just kept going. Thank you. Next, we have Nazreen, ninth grade from the Bronx, New York. My name is Nesreen, and my question is, what was an early experience where you learned that writing had a power? I think my first poetry slam, and I had been writing poetry for a long time before that, and I had known that when I read it out loud, people responded. But there's something about a slam, right? And for folks who don't know, a poetry slam is a competition where you would show up, um, and this is just typically, right? You have a three minute poem often memorized, you get on a stage, you perform that poem, and then it's like extreme figure skating with words because judges hold up a score, right? And that's just the game of it. it it's really a way to share poetry and the game is like who wins. 
But when I was 14 years old and decided to join a slam and there were 30 other young people and they all have these incredible poems. And I'm over here like, yo, I'm dope, right? On my block, I'm one of the best poets. I got this. Then I'm exposed to all these other people. I'm like, dang, they're good too, right? <laughs> and so it is this moment of, wow, look at what other folks are writing and look at how it moves me. And then I do my poem and I get off stage and people tell me, you know, what you said moved me. So that this exchange of all of us writing our individual experiences and then in one space realizing, oh, look at all these ways it connects, right? That all these things I was writing in isolation um, were resonating, but were also being thought about in different ways by this other group of people and I think it made me realize the extent to which a poem could be carried in the body, um, even when it wasn't your own. Frank? Uh, we have Tanzania, eighth grade from the Bronx. My question for Elizabeth Acevedo is, what is your writing process like? And if you ever do get a writer's block, what is your action to get back into your writing track? I love questions about craft. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to talk about this. My writing process changes, it depends on what I'm working on. I think poetry arrives in different ways and I'm really patient with poetry. I recognize that it's my, my way of telling myself what, I, what I'm working through, right? Poetry for me is very inward. I would say that um, majority of the poems I write don't go into the world, they're not for the world. Um, so for me, it's, it's when a poem is ready and I, I will think about a metaphor, I'll, I'll see an image or I'll hear someone say something, I'm like, oh, there's texture there, there's something there that I can pursue, but I, I kind of let the poem arrive organically. I'll, I'll think about it, but I don't necessarily sit down and like force it out. Prose for me is different. I think with prose, you have a character and that character waits for you to show up and if you don't show up, they think you ghosted them and they don't want to play with you anymore, right? So with prose, I, I feel like I have to show up every single day. I have to show a level of consistency to my characters so that they can trust me and tell me their story. And even with prose, things have changed for me. And I just want to be clear that sometimes these terms can get confusing, right? That when I say poetry and I mean verse, what I'm talking about there is an, um, a project of trying to grasp a human experience in the least amount of words possible. It is an efficiency of language. It is an attempt to really pay attention to sound devices and how can I get a reader to move to where I need them to emotionally as quick as I can through an image, through um, a quick enjambment. Prose, I think, has a little bit more breadth to it. You can take two or three pages describing the setting. You can allow a reader to kind of find their way in. They can skip a paragraph and still be in the story, right? And that to me is a different is a different project. And it requires my knowing a little bit more than I would in a poem. And so y'all might see behind me, I have these post-its. Um, it's my first attempt at outlining because as I've grown and am attempting to write new things, I, I have to change as a writer. And while I've never outlined, this book required me to do that. And so I think that part of being a writer and part of learning your process is to figure out what every single project needs from you. And that's gonna be different depending on the project and you just gotta kind of show up ready. I don't believe in writer's block. So this question is, I'm so sorry, it's not for me because I think, you know, I, I suffer less from I'm stuck and, and more from I have 10 ideas of things I wanna write and the urgency of all of it needing to be written um, is so real for me that, that I'm, I always know there's a thing I have to be working on and I have a sense of what it is. I will say that often when people talk about writers block, they're talking about two things. And one is probably um, a lack of inspiration. And the way that I address a lack of inspiration is by reading. Um, I'm competitive. So when I'm reading books, I'm like, oh, that was dope. They did that. I'm going to try that. Or like, mm, I think they could have done this. Like, I'm going to take note of that. And that sparks my creativity. So reading, taking an art, doing exhibits online. Um, you see a bunch of images behind me that I keep on my desk. So there's Frida Kahlo, there's work by Erin Robinson, who's an incredible artist, um, Ray Hart, who's an incredible artist. So I keep images that spark creativity. And if I'm stuck, I'm like, well, I'm gonna write a poem, an acrostic poem talking about this image, or I'm gonna think through traditional dress of the Dominican Republic and try to figure out if I can describe that. I give myself exercises. 
The other way that writer's block work is that you, you're working on something and you just don't know where the story is going or you don't know where the poem can go. And so you feel like you can't move on. And I'll say for that, I just give myself permission to jump. I'm not a linear writer. If I'm stuck in the moment of, I don't know what this character is gonna do to get out of this situation. Well, I know this character is gonna end up at a party at some point, so I'm gonna write the party scene. <laughs> I know this character is gonna have beef with their mom, so I'm gonna write that. So I just give myself permission to always be working even if it's not about it ending up in the book or it being published. I just, you know, if you create, things will come from that. So I hope that answers your question. We now have Amiya uh, from New York, New York, eighth grader. How do you know when your work is ready to be read by other people? This is a good question. Um, I will admit that I struggle with letting work go. I'm uh, somewhat of a perfectionist. And so <laughs> my editor kind of has to rip it out of my hands and just be like, we have to send it in this at this point. <laughs> Something has to be published. but. I, I think over time, writers develop a sense of, okay, this is the best that I can do right now. And, and when you know that, you decide, well, I have to either become the writer that can make this better and learn that skill, or I can decide that this is enough and, and put it out. And to give an example of what I mean by that, I started writing The Poet X, my first novel in 2012. I probably had a first draft done um, maybe a year later. It wasn't good. And I, I knew it wasn't good. I knew I hadn't been writing fiction. I knew that it was a new skill set. I had never written a whole story arc. And I had to teach myself how to do that. And I didn't finish that novel until 2016 because I had to read a lot and study a lot and practice a lot and write two other books and then come back and say, okay, now I know. And when I, I did that next draft, I knew this is the best book I could do right now. And I think it's enough. I can't wait another however many years, but I've been working on a poetry collection for six years. And I know, you know, it's not there yet. I'm not ready to put it into the world versus clap when you land. When that joint was done, I was like, this joint is done. Like, <laughs> there's nothing more for me to say. These characters have arrived where I needed them to arrive. Um, this book became something I hadn't even expected. There was delight, there was surprise, there was there was hurt, and and as in the writing, I mean, and I'm I'm okay letting this go. There are other things that need my attention now, and so I think every writer, as you make, you find kind of that line of, um, this is the best I can do right now, or you know I want to hold on to it, and and you just got to learn to listen. We have Katie A, a ninth grader from the Bronx. Hi, my name is Katie Abreu, and my question for Elizabeth Acevedo is, do you want each book to stand out on its own, or are you trying to build a body of work with connections between each book? OK, but can we talk about how these are some of the best questions? <laughs> I don't often get the same questions at events, but these are so unique. Um, I love this so much. And I, yeah, I, I appreciate it because I'm often asked, like, are you going to write a sequel to the Codex? Are you going to write a sequel to the Fire and High? Are you gonna, like every book people want a sequel. And for me, I write these little worlds. And when I have gotten the character to where they are, they have resolved within themselves what they needed in order to stand on their own two feet. I'll say that almost all of my characters are struggling with a way of owning themselves at the beginning of the book. And they usually, by the time I get them to a place where they can do that confidently, I know, all right, now I let this character go. And I, I am so thankful people fall in love with these characters, but they are their own thing. I will say though, that as a writer, I'm incredibly aware and intentional about the legacy of work that I'm building. That for me, I think about the pantheon of young women that I'm trying to depict, the ways in which they express their Afro-Latinidad, their um, girlhood, their hopes and dreams and struggles in different ways. That there's no one way, right, to be a brown or black girl. There's no one right way to perform our identities. And, and I try to show that from book to book. Imani is different and Siomara is different than Camino in the way that they relate to themselves, to their communities, to the world. And I, I 
I often felt like that I had to be the right kind of Elizabeth Acevedo <laughs> at all times. And I, I hope to, to maybe free some people to think differently of, oh, I can be, you know, different than the expectations that folks might have of me. And so the legacy, even with this adult book, even with my poetry, even with my young adult novels, is, is something that I, I think about and I want the books to be in conversation with each other. So I appreciate that question because I think it, it gets into every writer's project, which is, you know, what are you trying to leave behind? And um, I hope these books are a testament to, to the people I love. We have Madison, a ninth grader from the Bronx. Hello, Ms. Acevedo. My question to you is, with being a person of color, did you go through a variety of experiences that led to your writing and to you spreading your message? Hi, Madison. I love that she waved and said hello. <laughs> <laughs> Madison, that's a great question. Um, this is also a really difficult question because I don't know, I can't separate myself from my experiences, right? I don't know what kinds of experiences may have been different. I can, of course, presume, but I, I know that I had to hustle hard, you know, and there wasn't a blueprint. There was no easy way for me to fully um, know how to do this thing I wanted to do. I didn't know professional poets. I didn't know any writers. I didn't know people who wrote books. And although I was a voracious reader, I really thought that, that books were for other people to write. And when I was a teacher, I taught eighth grade English in Prince George's County, Maryland. I had 80% um, of my students were Latinx. Uh, almost 20% of my students were black. They had never had a Latina teacher teaching a core subject. They had never had an Afro-Latina teaching period. And here I am in this space where my students in eighth grade on average had a sixth grade reading level. And I'm preparing them for high school, knowing that they can't read at the level that they need to. And I'm talking to my students and I'm trying to give them all these books, all the exciting books at the time, Hunger Game, Twilight, eh, The Virgin, The Tho, right? And, and my kids didn't care. Like some of them did and they were, they were devouring Hunger Games. But my students who were struggling sometimes, what they wanted, what they were looking for were different kinds of characters, different kinds of folks. And I had to figure out how to put those books in their hands. And so being a person of color, I know that my trajectory of how I became confident um, happened at a point in life that maybe would have been different, right? Because it took a student looking at me and saying, where are the books about us? You're a writer, where are the books about us? And my having to face, why have I always thought that because I'm not an old white man, I can't write a book? What made me think that because I maybe didn't learn syntax um, as well as other people or went to public school my whole life. And I know that there are gaps in my education that, that this is for someone better than me. What does that mean? And it took my looking at a student and realizing the lack of confidence that I had um, to, even though I was a writer, right? Even though I knew that I was a writer, I had trained to be a writer. And so I think that there's these little things that we often don't talk about that stop a lot of creative people from putting work into the world because of um, all the perceptions of no one will publish it. It's gonna be so difficult to get an agent. I don't know if I have a readership, which are reinforced. Like these aren't made up things. Like they're reinforced time and time again that certain groups of people are not enough. And um, I, I really thank my students for kind of jostling me out of that mindset, but I. I think often of the people who are such creative and wonderful and imaginative folks who may be um, because of the backgrounds they have, you know, don't think there's a place for their work. And I, I you know, that's probably how I would approach this question. And uh, that's what I got for you. <laughs> um, we don't have a video here, but we do have a question from Jasmine, a seventh grader from New York, New York. She asks, at what age did you write your first poem? Hey, Jasmine. Um, I wrote my first poem at eight years old and it went something like, um, what is it? Dolphins don't kill dolphins and birds don't kill birds, but people kill people and that really hurts. The reason I don't know, the reason I don't care, all that I know is the reason isn't fair. Um, I now know that dolphins are quite violent. 
and we'll actually kill each other. But <laughs> at the time, I was just, I told you, I was really moved by what I was seeing in my neighborhood and when I was growing up. And this fierce sense of, um, of justice to some extent, of we need to stop violence, <laughs> was big. But, you know, even at eight years old, I was, I was trying to put language to, to really difficult things. And um, it's probably why I encourage young people so much to write and create and hold on to their work because I think it, it meant a lot to me to have a place to put my thoughts and feel safe that they could um, exist there. So uh, happy to share my eight-year-old poem with you. <laughs> Great. Uh, sorry about those dings. They're actually my computer in, in the background and, and I those are chats that are coming up and I can't do anything about them. So I apologize for that. Um, the, uh, this comes from Tiffany. Uh, seventh grade uh, from Massachusetts. Do you think family support is important if you want to be a writer? I think family is important, um, period. I think to walk through the world, family is important. I think family can look like and be many things. We have a perception of this is the right kind of family and we call other families dysfunctional. I don't know who came up with the definitions of the, the perfect family, but I don't think it came from my community. Um, my father grew up with a bunch of primo hermanos. I love that there's a term in Spanish for primo hermano, cousin brother, right? Cousin sibling, right? I, I know in the Dominican culture, we have criados, someone who is raised, even if they are not of that family, but they are of that family, <clears throat> right? We have, we have so many terms, compadre, comadre. I love that, comadre co-mother. That's uh -huh. beautiful. We allow such an expansiveness <clears throat> for what a family could look like, what a chosen family could look like. So even if perhaps someone's personal family isn't supportive of their dreams, of their writing, of, of what they choose to write, I think one can find a community of writers or of support or of friends that um, that will be family to them, right? And and I I write a lot about family. For me, it is it is something I'm constantly trying to explore. I, I think the way we are raised in units, the way that we then move into the world and create other units, um, there's something really interesting to look at and consider there. But I, I wanna be clear that um, family can be many things. And I often speak to folks who maybe have families that are not supportive of who they are, whether because they're queer or they're trans or they're, um, they're dark or whatever the thing is. That, that maybe keeps them from their family and they think, well, if I don't have that support, you know, how can I, how can I do, how can I be? And I, I love the language we have around chosen family that's emerged, um, particularly from the queer community, because I think it gives English a way to start thinking about how permeable our definitions of family can be, right? And that they can hold a lot more water and we sometimes give them credit for. So thank you for that question. Um, we have from Yahami uh, D from Massachusetts. What was the inspiration you had to write the book, The Poet X? Yeah, I talked a little bit about my students and I began writing The Poet X in 2012 when I was a teacher um, because of that student, Catherine Bolanos, who asked me where are the books about us? Um, we never see any books about us. And I wanted to address that. But I, I will also say that the inspiration for the Poet X initially was I had never seen a book that talked about poetry slams. And having grown up in this subculture of poetry, I, I found it fascinating. I loved the experiences I had when I was growing up in the poetry community, the way that I got to learn from um, teaching artists and mentors and, and was taken seriously for what I thought and believed and what I could write. You know, even as a teenager, there was there were so many people who affirmed that I had writing chops, even when I didn't. Right. I think I had a lot of passion. I don't know that it was always very good, but but they 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 told me to keep going. And um, and that was huge for me. So I wanted to capture that in the poetics. I wanted to make sure that the novel had this this really cool thing that I had grown up doing in it. Um, I don't like writing or reading books about religion. And so when the book started going in that direction, I was like, no, 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 espera, they come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where I'm trying to go, right? We have enough controversial topics as it is. But 
but that too felt like something we hadn't seen. Um, for the Dominican Republic to be such a heavily Catholic place, and I would say a lot of Latin America is, right? Um, it is a, a remnant of, of colonialism. Um, it felt important to allow a character to ask questions, right? To, to maybe wonder about an institution that has such a huge part of, of Latinx people's lives. And, um, and once I saw the poetry and the church kind of coming together, I realized, oh, these two, two things being smacked are really interesting. And so the poetics kind of came out of, you know, how does this young woman learn um, the power of language, whether it be prayers or poetry? How does she learn what it means to be herself, whether it be through the doctrines of the church or the boundaries she learns to set? That to me, it became interesting to see what a, a character could do um, trying to navigate that book. Um, I think every book, and you might get, you know, if you ask me tomorrow, I'd give you a different answer because I think every book has many inspirations and many origins and they kind of come together and converge and you can find different threads for this was the reason I wrote it. But on this particular morning, that's that's the answer I'm going to give you. <laughs> um, this is from Anya. <clears throat> Anaya. What got you into making poems? Eighth grade from the Bronx. Um, I talked a little bit about the inspiration and this is what I mean about different origins. Cause I'm like, I think one of the questions sounded like this, but you know what that though, because I have another answer for you. <laughs> My mother is an incredible storyteller. Incredible, right? She um, is a campesina from, uh, she was born in Bonao, she was raised in many places, but in Cotuí, if you're from DR, you know these are incredibly rural places in the center of the island. So not coastal in any regard, not destinations, not tourist sites. This is just El Campo. And when I was a child growing up in New York City, to hear my mother tell me about stealing her father's jegua, right? Her father's mare and trying to ride it into town and falling off of it and dropping all the things she was supposed to pick up at El Colmado. And like then having to realize I lost the horse and I lost the food I was supposed to pick up. As a child, I was fascinated. I was just like, there were horses <laughs> and you rode them, right? Like to me, it felt as fantastical as Harry Potter in some ways. The Dominican Republic is a magical place. Right, folks still believe in magic. We're super superstitious. We have all of these um, folk tales we pass on. And so my interest in storytelling, while I was a big reader, was in oral storytelling, was in how I heard my mother describe this place, was in my grandfather who had a third grade education but could tell these riddles for, for 15, 20, 30 minutes, right? He, he had memorized them. It was from my father who would tell inappropriate barbershop jokes, <laughs> but always got the comedic timing right. You know, and so I'm learning then about humor. I'm learning about timing. I'm learning about pace. And when we talk about, you know, craft and workshop and the things you need to know, I, I sometimes have to reflect on why I did such a discredit to my early literary influences when I thought I had to have read Faulkner in order to write, when I had such rich experiences of literature, whether that was, you know, oral literary traditions right at home. And, and it was hip hop. It was the dudes on my corner who would let the little shorty join them in a cypher. That was my first workshop. Those dudes who would be like, oh, nah, shorty, you got to have, uh, you know, better bars or we, you got to push the line or we need more of a punchline. That these untraditional, very traditional <laughs> methods of learning language moved me. And so I write poems because I am in the tradition. You know, that's it. That's it. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me. When did you realize you wanted to be an author? Did you think that being Latina would affect your chances of becoming one? Uh, from Aliyah. Aliyah, when did you realize you wanted to be an author? I think I knew I wanted to write books pretty early. Um, I am really lucky to have gone to a school where I had a teacher named Phil Bildner. Um, I had him both in sixth and eighth grade. He was such an advocate of me as a reader, probably one of the first teachers to see how much I hungered for story and put every book in my hand that I could. 
we used to have a competition where um, you were trying to read 25 books a year. I think folks still have that. Um, I read 84 when I was in Phil's class because here was someone who saw like, oh, if I keep putting books in her hands, she'll keep reading. But then he pushed beyond that, right? We used to have journals and I think he realized, oh, she's a writer. I'm gonna keep giving her assignments. And then he gave me assignments to write letters to authors, to read the books I was reading. Clearly I was I was uh, probably really annoying because I had all these special projects. I think Phil was trying to get me out his hair. <laughs> but he had me write letters and I wrote a letter in eighth grade to Angela Johnson who um, had written a book called Heaven about a young woman who learned she's adopted at the age of 15 and you know goes on a journey to figure out what that means for her. And there was a secondary character named Bobby who was a teen father. And I had never seen a teen father depicted in a novel ever. And I was fascinated by this character. And so Phil tells me to write Miss Angela Johnson a letter. And I'm like, that though, I'm gonna write her a letter. And my little 13 year old self thought I really had advice for this lady. So I write this three page letter, like we need more Bobby. I wanna know his story. How did he have this child? Why is he raising it alone? You know, all of these questions. And Angela Johnson did not write back. But two years later, a book came out called The First Part Last. And The First Part Last is the story of Bobby. And that book was dedicated to me. And it was the first time I think it really hit me that an idea I had had was good enough to share with a real life author and then was good enough to turn into a book, right? And I, I started realizing maybe I should keep those ideas to myself. <laughs> and that was, I think it was in the back of my head. And, and as I mentioned, it took me years to become confident enough to actually pursue writing a book, right? It took my having to, to face like, why haven't I done this yet? But I will say that I had hoped of, you know, it'd be really cool to have a book on a bookshelf one day, probably since that age. What a great answer. So YouTube questions. Yeah. When you're struggling with editing and revising your poems, what do you do? From Kimberly Contreras. Yeah, I'm a big believer that you know, poems are trying to tell us things and they're very stubborn sometimes, right? Sometimes they don't they don't know if we're ready yet or sometimes we're afraid of a poem. Um, it helps me to have a writing group. I have homies who I, I sit with and we send work to each other, um, two in particular, Clint Smith and Safio Hillo. They have read every single novel I've ever written. They've read um, every manuscript of poetry, even though they haven't been published too many times. Right, they know my poems and my project and my vision and how I was talking earlier, the legacy of work I wanna leave behind and having such an intimate relationship with other writers who can look at the work and say, I don't know if you're being honest. I don't know if you're pushing enough. I don't know if this metaphor is doing the work. Like what's up with this title that I trust is so helpful. I think we need, you know, and it goes back to the question of family. I think we need a writing family. We need folks who can see the work when we can't and give us feedback. Um, I also find that sometimes it's taking space, taking a week, taking two, taking a year. You might just not be the writer you need to be for that poem yet, right? And that's true. There are things that I've started and I go back five years later, I'm like, why didn't I finish this? Like, and then, I, and then I'm able to do the poem, but the life I needed to live to arrive at what the poem wanted to arrive at, I hadn't done yet. Um, so I'm incredibly forgiving when it comes to poetry and revising and all of that. I mean, I just, I, I feel there's no rush in ever putting a poem into the world. Wait until you're saying the thing you're trying to say. But I do think that critique partners or workshops or a mentor um, are helpful. Although having peers, one-to-one -one peers that you give to. Sometimes you learn what your poem needs by giving advice to someone else's poem. You know, so just having those relationships where you're always thinking about language and words, you know, reflects back on the work. So I would advise a writer's group. And if you have a writer's group, um, maybe a workshop, maybe find another writer who you think is cool online and ask them if they want to see work. Maybe you need a new pair of eyes. Oh, and look at the verbs. Often people don't look at the verbs in poetry and I think verbs do um, the most work. So precise verbs. From Jainia, did you get hate on some of your poems? 
Hey, Janaya, did I get hate on some of my poems? Yeah, if you go on YouTube, you can see all the comments. <laughs> don't read the comments is what I learned. I don't go on Goodreads anymore. I don't read those comments. I don't read the YouTube comments. But, you know, this is a world where people have a lot of opinions. And when you put work out, people will respond. And there's also work that I know that I feel differently about, where I, I realize, oh, I, you know, I could have said that differently, or I've grown in my thinking. If I were writing that poem, I might leave that line out, or I might push against that, or I don't know if that was the most empathetic way to approach that. And so I, I think that there, you know, it's growth to be able to say that, yeah, a poem I wrote six years ago was about who I was six years ago, and, and it's okay if it doesn't have a long lasting life, because, you know, I, I've now moved on in my thinking. And I, I appreciate that I learned that from hip hop, that there were rappers whose albums I loved and then would listen to later. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I agree with all of that. But then they would come out with new work. And I'm like, oh, look at the evolution of how they've also grown. And so giving ourselves permission to be fully human when we're creating and, and allowing growth is important. But I, you know, everyone has an opinion. And I know who I write for. I know who my audience is. I know the kind of love I craft my characters with. And not everything is for everyone. And I'm I'm thankful that people can find other poems and other writers. And I don't have to be the only one people turn to. So um, if my work is not for you, like, cool. I hope you find someone who, who is. Nice. We have about <clears throat> four minutes left. I don't know if we have any more YouTube uh, questions. Hey, uh, Beach County. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I, I might have one if we have time, but if not, uh, here's one from Casey. As a teacher, I'm wondering what her advice is for educators who want to teach creative writing in school despite limitations within the curriculum. Listen, Casey, when I did my interview with my principal, um, I had all these plans of wanting to do writing. And I, I come in as a poet. So I'm like, we're going to do creative writing. I want to do these kinds of essays. And when the poetry unit comes up, and I was told explicitly, um, you know, writing isn't on the MSA. All they need to know is how to do a brief constructive response. And it was heartbreaking, the kinds of expectations that we had for, for young people writing. I was lucky enough to have started a poetry club with another teacher um, at the school. So we held a poetry club once a week with the sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And it was an opportunity to allow those students um, who had a lot of skills and who had maybe thought about writing to share in that space and to see our students in different ways. So I wonder if there's a way to do it as an extracurricular, but also I snuck it into class all the time. My do nows would be reflections. If they were reading um, an assignment, the homework assignment might be to respond to it through a poem from the point of view of the character. If we were working on an objective that had to do um, with context clues, and I had my students write a commercial on all the information that, that could be provided through context clues and how we could use persuasive, I would also have them think about, well, what's the copy? How are you going to make sure that people are listening? Is there a slogan? So I tried to bring writing in to the way the curriculum already existed through journaling, through extra credit, um, through poetry class. We used to have a unit on poetry and I would have a poetry slam at the end and invite kids' parents, right? And we would have a little cafe. You can't bring snacks anymore, you can't bake. Um, but, but we would have juice and like, you know, there would be a little curtain and students would have to get up and read their poems. And it was, um, I, I just, I, I, I centered what I knew was one of my objectives, even if it wasn't the curriculum's objective and tried to find ways to, to kind of, to fill it in. And I, I think I had a pulse on my students because I had a pulse on their writing. And so what they were feeling and thinking came through in the work and I, I kind of could tell, you know, where we were or, or what they were processing. So I think it is incredibly important to, to, be a rebel when it comes to writing, even if um, it is incredibly difficult at the school you're at. Great. Well, in the last minute, I, uh, I have a comment and a question that's kind of a pun. My comment is um, that a lot of times my students, of course, are faced with the ominous page, the blank page, and they think they have to start at the top and go to the bottom 
and that's the only way to write. Yeah. But what I see behind you is what I try to encourage them to do, which is sometimes you take a note on a yellow sheet or on the back of a page or on, you know, uh, cardboard paper or whatever. Um, and I see all these beautiful, beautiful uh, yellow sheets behind you, those sticky sheets. But the one that's jumping out at me is the question mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I similarly, I think sometimes I might get stuck with what I think I have to write. And, and sometimes what I have to write is just, what am I trying to figure out? For me, writing is about wonder. It's about not about providing answers or looking for answers, but what are the questions? You know, and I think there's something really freeing about whatever method gets you moving is, is the right method. So thank you so much. This is a beautiful uh, pleasure. Alfredo, Elizabeth, this has been such an amazing, amazing conversation. I mean, the comments have just been just wonderful. People are so inspired by everything you've had to say, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And everybody just hang on. We have a special video where Elizabeth is going to take us behind the scenes. We're going to meet her familia. So hang tight. We're going to say bye to live and uh, live Alfredo and live Elizabeth, but we're going to go backstage to see a little bit of Elizabeth's uh, home. Cuídense. Thank you so much. Placing my head in the crook of your neck makes me happy to be alive. Eyes closed, hands clasped, don't breathe, and maybe we will live like this forever. It be gibberish, but everything you say sounds like poetry. I missed you. This was supposed to be a question, not a poem or confession or whatever it's become. I just wanted to know if you would listen with me to the sound of our heartbeats. I'm happier in the kitchen than anywhere else in the world. Angelica thinks it's because we live in the hood, so we never have exactly the right ingredients. We gotta innovate, baby. Abuela says that my food doesn't just taste good. It is good, straight up bottle goodness that warms you and makes you feel better about your life. I think I just know that if everything else goes wrong, a little squeeze of lime and a bottle of hot sauce ain't never hurt nobody. I was raised so damn Dominican. Spanish, my first language. Bachata, a reminder of the power of my body. Platano and salami for years before I ever tasted peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. If you ask me what I was, and you meant in terms of culture, I say Dominican. No hesitation, no question about it. Can you be from a place you've never been? You can find the island stamped all over me. But what would the island find if I was there? Can you claim a home that does not know you, much less claim you as its own? I am about to quit when I see a profile, but the picture is only a black box and the date my father died. Although the profile is private, I can see some posts, including condolence messages. I will always miss Pops, writes a girl named Andrea, and my heart thumps in my chest. I write a quick sentence and press send before I can stop myself. There is no way she can't know who I am once she sees it. Mommy wanted me to be a lady, sit up straight, cross my ankles, let men protect me. Papi wanted me to be a leader, to think quick and strike hard, to speak rarely, but when I did, to always be heard. Me, playing chess taught me a queen is both deadly and graceful, poised and ruthless, quiet and cunning. 
a queen offers her hand to be kissed and can form it into a fist while smiling the whole damn time. But what happens when those principles only apply in a game? And in the real world, I am not treated as a lady or a queen, as a defender or opponent, but as a girl. So many want to strike off the ball. I think when you're born in a city, your playground is also your neighborhood, is your community, is your building. So much of our neighborhood was um, captured in these few blocks. Everything we needed was was here. This building is where my best friend lives. We used to stand on our fire escapes and like wave to each other or talk on the phone. <laughs> and so I've always been lucky that she was right there. Uh, the lady who used to make my birthday cakes <laughs> lived across the street. It's exciting to be back. It's exciting to be on top of the world, right? Because this is my world and to be able to share it with you all. And so much of Clap When You Land is a book that is fantastical, is about um, imagining a very different life. But so much of Clap When You Land is also honoring this community. I was 13 years old when flight AA587 crashed to the ground in Queens, New York. It was on its way to the Dominican Republic. 260 people plus five people on the ground died. More than 90% of the passengers were of Dominican descent. Many were returning home. It completely rocked the New York Dominican community. I've been wanting to write about that flight for as long as I could remember. I was a writer even then. I think even at 12, 13, I was, I was trying to write through what that meant, right? Or keeping track of the news and like writing down different, different dates or, or when new research came out. It's something about me just felt like this doesn't make sense. I'll say that in college, the idea of clap when you land came to me. I was an undergrad and I remember wanting to capture the joy of that that moment when the plane first skids, right, against the runway, and you know you made it, or okay. But that that celebration, that almost um, communal exhalation on the plane of like releasing the breath that you didn't even know you've been holding. And some at some point, these two ideas kind of came together. It is it is that exhale, it is that joy. But also, what, what does it mean to mind memory to think through the days and the moments that didn't end up with that joy that didn't end up in celebration and can we honor the morning <laughs> Welcome to my house. This is where I grew up. This is my dad, hey, Pop. <laughs> 41 years. 41 years in this same apartment where me and my siblings were raised and where my parents still live. This is me after my first poetry slam, um, where I made the team and my, my both my brothers came. You see all our high school graduation pictures. She wants you to know this is when she was 20 years old. She's popping. <laughs> I love pictures. You can tell this is a picture day picture. Why well, I'm holding a teddy bear, I don't know. Daddy, who's my best friend, who Daddy Dalvin, the poet X, is named after her. And then this picture is me with my cousins. And this is the first summer that, um, I went to DR by myself. I went when I was six months old, so I was really young. And these are still my closest cousins, right? If they were like the sisters I had over there. Daddy was the sister I had here who lived across, you know, across the way. These were the cousins that were really like the siblings who were in a slightly farther place. The world only pays attention to you when you're a vacation destination. And the moment that all of a sudden you remind them we are actual humans with dreams and lives and deaths that need to impact 
the larger scope of how you see us. It's like, oh, well, we only cared about the palm trees, right? We only cared about the surfboarding. And so I think that Clap When You Land is, was trying to think about like, how do you view places that are just your playground? Thank you.